So I guess the reason I'm here is um, this, a book that I wrote with uh, Michael Nantwich from the Austrian Academy of Science uh, and uh, was released uh, 2012 at Campus. Um, and there we uh, conducted case studies on various web, web platforms. So we looked at social network sites from Facebook to Google Plus to the scientific ones like ResearchGate and so on, microblogging like Twitter, Wikipedia, uh, Google including Google uh, Scholar and Google Books. And yes, also Second Life if someone remembers that. Um, what we did is we basically combined document analysis, uh, participatory observation and literature reviews. And our question was, well, pretty much what, what we all interested here, I guess, uh, in uh, is how does web to zero change scholarly communication? Which in our case means the internal and external scholarly communication. Um, but um, yeah, if you expect a summary of this book, I unfortunately must disappoint you. Um, instead, I wanna uh, go another way and um, connect to the book by um, going on a more abstract level and uh, come to broader conclusions connected to this book. And um, yeah, because I wondered what, what can we learn from, from the observations we made, her, uh, we made there. And so I'm basically trying to, uh, to do a next step. So um, yeah, as you can see from the title, there's a strange word beta society in there. Um, yeah, I know the sociologists are horrible. They always have to add another society. And um, I'm willing to change that if someone can convince me that it's a bad idea. It's okay. Um, so uh, obviously the term beta uh, connects the software, meaning software that is not ready yet, basically. And um, to get into that, I would like to refer to an article that probably, or later a book also, uh, that probably a lot of you know with an interesting metaphor. Uh, and that's Raymond, he came up with a um, metaphor that software uh, in the 90s, he's talking about uh, how it used to be built like cathedrals. And now the way of de software developing, he's thinking here about Linux and so on. Uh, more resembles um, a bazaar. So basically he's talking about a top-down approach versus a bottom-up approach. And um, in the bazaar model, the idea would be release early, release often, and listen to your customers. That's an important change there. And um, to go a bit more into detail there, I'd like to quote him. So in the traditional model, he says, there, um, the uh, software was built like cathedrals, carefully crafted by individual wizards with no better to be released before its time. And now in the model like it's uh, used uh, by Linux and so on, um, it more resembles a great babbling bazaar of differing agendas and approaches out of which a coherent and stable system could seemingly emerge only by a succession of miracles. So what I think we can observe now in the last 10, 15 years, uh, if we think about um, web to zero, the platform-based web, the cloud computing, mobile devices, these kind of trends. So what we have here is a, basically a radicalization of the bazaar model and a trend towards a permanent better status. And for the user, that means his role is also changed uh, dramatically. Um, Raymond and, and also authors like O'Reilly um, refer to him as a co-developer. So there's this participatory notion. And now, as we all know, if we look at services like Google, uh, sorry, Google um, the user very much becomes a commodity, becomes a product. So what are the characteristics of, characteristics of what I would call the better society? And I'm talking about society, I mean, I know I'm talking about software here, but I think the term society here is, um, is okay because um, simply the scale we are talking about, how many people use these services. So 
Thereby, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's correct to talk about the society here uh, as a whole. So, um, I would say the characteristics here are instability, dependency, lacking accountability, low barriers, and hidden costs. What do I mean by that? So, while instability is pretty clear, we know that these services are changing all the time, and uh, there's not much to be done about it, and we, as users, have constantly to adapt to it. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, dependency, there's a dependency on, on several levels. Um, although the original model uh, suggests this participatory element, um, we know all the protests that Facebook, for example, causes when they again change the uh, design and suddenly there are these groups again said, why does it look like this now and why did you change this, why did you change that? And uh, not much people can do about it. And of course, um, users are also depending um, on these services simply in their daily life. Every day they're using it for all kinds of purposes um, and now even more so with mobile devices, it's always at their hands. Um, so, and to explain what I mean with lacking accountability, I would like to, uh, to point you to an example which is pretty representative, I think, for these services we are looking at. Um, and that's uh, the terms of, services, uh, terms of service of Google. Um, other than as expressly set out in these terms or additional terms, neither Google nor its suppliers or distributors make any specific promises about the services. For example, we don't make any commitments about the content within the services, the specific function of the services, or their reliability, availability, or ability to meet your needs. We provide the services as is. So that sounds like the typical boring legal language, so I would like to put that a bit more briefly. Um, Excuse me, I know that's not exactly appropriate for an academic conference, but I, um, I just thought that sums it, a bit uh, up, uh, it sums it up a bit better. Um, so, um, yeah, so we have um, also low barriers and hidden costs. Low barriers is also, again, obvious um, if we think about Google and uh, well, the big players, they try, since the users are now the commodity, since they are the product, they try to, of course, make it as easy as possible to let the, the users in. At the same time, they're trying to hide um, the cost of it. For example, that their data might be used and so on. Um, also, the, the, the problems that might appear. Um, they're, of course, trying to hide it. And, um, well, where it's hidden, for example, is what we just saw, the terms of service. And uh, I would like to um, refer to an interesting example. I think um, this protest website, basically, terms of service didn't read. And they say, uh, I have read and agree to the terms is the biggest lie on the web. We aim to fix that. So they have an initiative going on. But uh, to, to back that up with some, something more scientific, there was a study um, that estimated that an average user would have to spend 40 minutes per day only with reading terms of service. And the interesting um, thing here is from 2008. So before everyone was walking around with a mobile device with 100 apps on it and so on. Um, so I, w I wonder how this number would look like now. I'm actually not aware of any uh, more recent study, but I'm also, I must admit, I didn't particularly look for it, so if someone knows that, I would be very interested. Okay, so if we go back and think about this um, software development model, uh, the, the, go back to this bazaar model, as Raymond had it in mind, and think about the developments that I just pointed out, uh, I, would, I would argue that this bazaar model is actually not really uh, what we can use anymore to describe the situation. Uh, also, the, the, idea, the, the, the idea release early, release often, and listen to your customers doesn't exactly describe it anymore. What I would suggest as a metaphor, so, uh, therefore, is the mall. So, malls are obviously very structured and uh, dominated by big brands. They are very well monitored and guarded by security. Um, 
And the theme here would be stay permanently bitter, monitor, analyze, and commodify your users. So you, of course, now all wonder, how is this a problem for science? So, well, the simple answer is scientists are and will be part of the better society simply because they're using all these tools. And as we all believe, I guess, they will do so even more in the future. And what I would, what I would say what we should do is question these low barriers that I talked about um, and, and look for the hidden costs of these services. Um, so I want to give you an example of what that could mean. Um, a lot of the providers, the developers, have this talk about this ideology of openness, basically, to promote their platforms. For example, uh, Iyad Madish, just in February, I think it was, um, so he's a CEO and co-founder of ResearchGate, the uh, academic social network site that most of you probably know. He said, uh, in 2008, we set out with ResearchGate to help scientists embrace the web. We believe scientific data should be shared, used, reused, distributed, and discussed. This is the heart of open science, and it is founded on the principle of open source. So I have my doubts, to be honest. Um, for example, if we look at this rather uh, recent idea of ResearchGate, the RG score, um, well, basically what it is, what they claim it is, the RG score is a metric that measures scientific reputation based on how all of your research is received by your peers. If you look what it, uh, closer at it, what it actually does, you will find that the factors are contributions to ResearchGate and interaction between ResearchGate members. So I would say there is a fine difference because there they say it's all of your research um, and how it's received by your peers. And here it's suddenly ResearchGate only. And that is an important difference, I would say. Um, because if you limit it like that, ResearchGate, the ResearchGate score from this perspective is rather a clever marketing tool to create traffic for an aggressive startup than a serious metric to measure scientific reputation. So the hidden cost in this case um, well, simply wasted time if it doesn't do what you want it to do. Um, then there is, of course, a potential negative impact on scholars and academia due to the dubious methods we have there. And if we think about the claimed openness, I don't see it. Um, the methodology is not open. We have no idea how this factor comes into being, really. And um, the involved data is obviously also not open. As I said, it's all limited to research gain. OK, to be fair, they at least call it RG score, so they make clear it's research gate. But um, the claim they make before is just not right. Uh, to come to another um, more prominent example, simply Google, which is probably the low barrier interface. And um, well, a lot of problems we don't need to talk about, obviously, the um, privacy uh, concerns uh, uh, something that it's something that we read about every day in the newspaper so I really don't think I need to get into detail here uh, some things we also talked about already uh, during this conference for example um, that Google may be ineffective due to low ranking of scholarly content and therefore um, there were already ideas introduced uh, to um, to, to perform academic search engine optimization so that the um, academic content is ranked higher. That's, of course, particularly important on the universal, like the, the general web search engine, because that's, of course, including everything you can think of. Um, but actually, as this paper suggests, uh, also for, for the specific, uh, academically specific uh, Google Scholar, and what's interesting there is that um, two of these authors who wrote about this academic search and optimization, they were accused, um, if, you, if you suggest something like that, that's very close to academic search uh, engine spam, actually. And as, as everyone who knows anything about uh, search and optimization, it's always a 
a thin line between spam and legitimate uh, uh, optimization. And so they tested it and found out um, that actually Google Scholar is very vulnerable to manipulation. So the picture you see here I find very interesting is um, they, they inserted invisible text into, a, um, in, into an article with uh, all kinds of keywords and Google Scholar did not recognize it as a form of manipulation. So if you do something like that, suddenly your paper becomes extremely relevant for this particular keyword, and uh, that would be one method to do it. And, um, and then there's this point that I pointed out earlier, dependency. And what's interesting here, uh, for example, is that the almighty Google, um, about how much they do for us scholars, I recently talked to someone who was actually at Google Scholar. I can't really tell you how quotable this information is, but I was very surprised to hear that the team of Google Scholar consists of seven people. If anyone knows that better um, and thinks this is bullshit, please tell me, but that's just what I heard and uh, that's not, not, not what I would expect. The whole issue of dependency is of course a bit bigger, so I need a clean si slide. Um, in many fields, of course, Google has no real competitors, no alternatives, um, particularly in web search, obviously, not only because of the big market share, but also because Google pretty much is the only company which has a web search index of that, uh, a web index of that scale um, that's also um, making money because Microsoft's uh, index is not making money and they rather maintain it for strategic reasons. And then we, of course, have pro um, projects like the digitalization of books, uh, Google Books, which is also uh, not reached by anyone at this scale. So whether we like it or not, Google and other big players create a new reality here. And these services are too important and valuable to ignore. We, no one of us wants to pretend Google is not there and no one says, oh, let's not use Google Books and so on. So we have to live with these problems somehow. And the question is how now? How do we live with these problems? What ways could we go? Well, of course, we can just give up. Um, we can try to improve the situation and we can try the impossible. I will tell you what I mean. Um, so giving up is basically uh, an idea, um, I'm a bit evil to say it like that, but Simona Kortekas from the uh, Utrecht University Library said, our users are on the internet and use Google or Google-like discovery tools. They find the, con the content they need and then expect the library to deliver the content. We concluded that if indeed this is the world of our users, if this is reality, if big commercial companies are able to offer freely accessible search engines containing scientific content, there really is no need for libraries to try and pull their users back to the library systems. And I'm not really criticizing Corticas here. In fact, I think um, it, it's, it's very good that she pointed out this out in this clarity because I do think we need a, we need a real discourse on this issue. Uh, another strategy is well, basically to help users provide education. Most people don't know anything about search uh, and so also for other big web platforms, how is actually the functionality, what are actually the hidden costs and so on. Um, then to provide support and in this sense I found uh, uh, yesterday's presentation about uh, Excess also very interesting to basically the idea of in injecting the content which is not immediately there, like which is lost in the long tail of Google and so on, uh, to, to inject and bring it to the user actively. I think that's, a, that's an interesting uh, suggestion there. Um, and then the impossible, which is basically creating alternatives. And um, just two days ago, um, I was at a very interesting workshop um, and we we starting to, to um, yeah, we're starting an initiative right now which is ambitious and some might say it's completely crazy, but the idea would be to create an independent index of the web. It's an uh, initiative that Professor uh, Dick Lewandowski from the University of Applied Science here in Hamburg uh, has suggested. 
Um, but we'll go too far now to talk about that in more detail, but if you're interested, I would be very happy to talk about it later. Um, so to sum it up, how can academia meet the challenge of the better society? I have some ideas, uh, as I pointed out already now. Um, academia needs to keep its independence by creating and maintaining its own platforms with open standards and addressing academic needs. But we also need to deal with the powerful existing and future platforms, and I think we should do so in a proactive, critical, and professional way. But we should also learn from the Silicon Valley. L listen to your users is surely not a bad idea, I would say. And uh, as Ursula Schulz yesterday pointed out, usability and usefulness are important, but I would say we would also need to talk about sustainable long-term solutions. Sustainability is something uh, that we have to look at, not only short-term, oh, this is a good service, it does what it does right now very well, but also what, what will be our long-term perspective. I do think academia needs to overcome the utopia and dystopia divide, which is for me a bit like the enemies of science 2.0 versus the blind supporters. And unfortunately, I often observe that there is this divide and they're fighting and they're not addressing the real issues that I would see. Um, we need to create alliances and think big and I would say far beyond academia and far beyond the disciplines we're used to. And um, yeah, it's something I found interesting that the previous speaker also said that uh, in, the, in the current system, it's very difficult to establish long-term and actually such big prob uh, projects. Uh, but I do think that's exactly what we need if we are challenged by these kind of global players. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Rene Koenig, for your presentation. We have time for some questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, really excellent. Um, a couple of years ago at the Frankfurt Book Fair, I asked somebody from Google if they could explain the difference or, or any or what difference there is between the algorithm for the main search and for Google Scholar. Um, they refused to answer that, but um, I just wondered, do you have uh, any idea how that sort of selection, I'm not talking about the kind of manipulation uh, that you were talking about at the content level, but as librarians, we're much more concerned about the order of research results, relevancy uh, in the research results. But do you know uh, what the different way that they approach the two is? How do they get academic sites, content sites, and so forth higher up in Google Scholar than they do uh, in Google? So you're asking particularly for websites or, or public? for websites. Now, that's actually one of the big mysteries, I would say. That's also, yeah, I, I, I can't answer that, no, sorry. Um, thank you for the presentation. Just a general comment about Google employees. Um, the number of seven might be might sound uh, a, li a little bit low, but um, uh, the other Google teams are um, of comparable size, at least from uh, from what I ha heard. And um, the whole Google uh, hires um, 10 times more people than Facebook and eight times more people than Yahoo. So, uh, uh, but still, this is only 50,000 people in total. So um, I wouldn't draw any um, conclusions uh, based on the number of, of the team. And actually, uh, there's an editorial in Science from January this year 
uh, about uh, the fact that the Google Scholar team is going to be expanded and they are um, developing new areas uh, of services to research. I guess it wasn't really a question, rather a comment, so I, I, I'll just leave it like it is. Uh, yeah. Further questions? Yes? Um, how is academic search by Microsoft doing uh, compared to Google Scholar? You took, didn't took it in your overview. To be honest, I, we didn't look at it at all, so I can't really help you with that. I'm sorry. <laughs>